For the sake of labeling myself, to establish relatability, and to present myself as a lovable but nerdy protagonist, I'll say I've always been a toy guy. That is, I like toys. Easy. <clears throat> Something about the tactile nature of a well-designed action figure, especially if there are multiple articulation points, rubs me just right. <laughs> Not in the script. By contrast, my hardworking former Marine heavy Arabic accented dad was a football guy. Now I love my dad, but I grew to hate football. He'd spend hours watching games on Sunday, going so far as to say we wouldn't be doing anything as a family until his games were over. So I'd sit on the living room floor, obsessing over stories in my head with little plastic players. But football wasn't the real problem, and toys were never the real solution. To this day, G.I. Joe is my plastic crack of choice. Now, I was too young for the original 12-inch G.I. Joe to lock me in his kung fu grip, but I was ripe for exploitation when Star Wars set the new small-scale standard for action figures and vehicles. And when G.I. Joe returned and brought Cobra with him in 1982, I ditched the straight-arm, straight-laced Star Wars toys for the posability and possibilities presented in four catchy words. Swivel arm battle grip. The first time I realized I could make G.I. Joe kneel and hold a rifle in both hands, I mean, I went ape shit over G.I. Joe. I spent every dime I had. <laughs> I begged at every birthday. I hinted at every Christmas for the th little three and three quarters inch man of action with the rubber band sternum. And I got him in spades. Oh, I was all in. I collected the comics from Marvel, written by Larry Hama and drawn by, drawn by Herb Trimpey. I bought the board game. I watched the cartoons. He'll fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Real American Hero. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe is the code name for America's top secret special missions force. Its purpose, to defend human freedom against Cobra, the ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world. He never gives up. He'll stay till the fight's won. G.I. Joe will dare. G.I. Real American Hero. G.I. My friends would come over and we'd spend an hour picking our teams, though we usually quit after that. It was a foregone conclusion that whoever picked Snake Eyes and or Storm Shadow would prevail, despite any F-14 Sky Strikers or massive amounts of plastic artillery. Sure, I had a Transformer, or eight, and tried out whatever random toy lines I could get my hands on, but for me, G.I. Joe was where it was at. And it wasn't even about playing with them. It was about having them in hand and letting my imagination run wild. I spent more time thinking of ways to play than actually playing, but that worked for me. Now you know. But knowing is half the battle. <laughs> uh. One of the things I loved about toys in the 80s was the send-away promotions. When you had to save up your Star Wars proofs of purchase for an Admiral Akbar, or your G.I. Joe flag points for a Sergeant Slaughter, or a militarized William the Refrigerator Perry figure. Right? I have that. Again, easy. I was in nerd heaven. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing once we receive your order. Oh, waiting never hurts so good. 
After three weeks, my heart would start pounding every time I went to the curb to check the mailbox. After six, I'd consider sending a letter to the company asking if I'd been stiffed or if my order had been lost in the mail. By eight weeks, I was a basket case. Until that magic day when a tiny white box addressed to Mr. Nasser Hellowa would arrive, stuffed carelessly with a toy I'd likely never buy in the store, but was certainly glad to get for free. Mainly, it was the getting of something delivered to my home for me, which really made me feel like Christmas came early every time. Little did I know that the internet, creeping up on us all like a cobra ninja, would eventually grant me this feeling on the reg. When I was 15 and really getting, getting into the swing of high school, I began to abandon toys. Because, girls. <laughs> I began to like them as more than Princess Leia stand-ins. They thought I was nice. I thought my toy collection would do little to put me over the just friends line. So I packed most of them up and put them into my parents' storage shed, lovingly called The Dungeon, safely sequestered from sight and mind. For most of the 90s, I was free of action figures. Instead, my vice was video games. Also not attractive to most of the girls I thought I liked, <laughs> but slightly less stigmatizing because they could be stored on the same shelves as books or CDs. Camouflage. <laughs> the internet continued to sneak up behind me, and somehow, despite the video games, and because she is just that compelling, I met and married the love of my life. We were hitched in 98, and for the first 10 years of our marriage, toys were out of the question. We started with a tiny condo, very little money, and newlywed bliss. She wanted to travel, so after I learned to let her handle the budget and give me an allowance to spend as I pleased, that's exactly what we did with our shared spare dollars. Eventually, our jobs started paying us more. So as dinks, that is, dual income, no kids, we were, we were pretty much able to get whatever we wanted, including our first personal computer. I grew up in a PC-free home, so it was huge to finally have my own portal to the World Wide Web. It was there, among the ones and zeros, masquerading as pictures and paranoia and nostalgia, that I was reminded, by those like me, of what I had left behind in the wake of my diminishing youth. I started slowly, however, like the child of Luddites I am, and I still wasn't buying toys online. In fact, I believed I was done with toys for the rest of my days. I had grown them, you see. Certainly, they didn't hold any appeal for a man who had kissed a girl. <laughs> I, was, I was almost free of them, but as Larry Hama used to write in the G.I. Joe comics, almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. In 2007... G.I. Joe's Real American Hero line celebrated its 25th anniversary. Toys began appearing on the shelves in Target and Walmart in the exact same packaging as the toys I used to buy in the 80s. Nostalgia hit me hard, but I resisted the urge to buy anything and felt pretty good about it for a while. But the toys just kept on coming. More and more figures of my favorite characters. And then a friend bought me one of the graphic novels chronicling the origins of the indomitable Snake Eyes. I began looking up more comics I'd missed, which led me to the vast fan sites I never knew existed. The G.I. Joe line I thought had died in the early 90s had been going on without me for years. And in my research, I saw it all laid out before me in plastic glory. Reviews, forums, a fan club, even homemade comics using the toys as props. Extensive, intriguing comics. They didn't have to play by the toy company rules of engagement. <laughs> one day, one day, I bought a four pack of figures just to see how they felt. The next day, I bought another and then some more. And then I was buying the old stuff online because they were getting cleared out to make room for the new stuff. And it was so easy to do. And there were the forums of actual people who had been doing it for years. And they seemed cool. I mean, how can guys called Darkwind, Jimbotron, and Gyre Viper not be cool? And hey, 
I was just buying toys. It wasn't like I was buying drugs or hookers. Toys, man. Toys. <laughs> but it's never one toy, is it? <laughs> In my internet scouring, I came across the rebirth of that big lug I'd known about but never really had a serious relationship with. He-Man. <laughs> the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe toy line was a contemporary and rival of G.I. Joe in the 80s, but I never got on board. My parents refused to buy them for me. I guess they felt weird giving their kids half-naked bodybuilders with names like He-Man, Ram Man, and Fisto. All equipped with not much more than loincloths, swords, and glistening physiques. Though to my mind, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe seem pretty much the same as the football players my dad liked, but with real motivations. The fate of planet Eternia is a far more noble cause than a Super Bowl ring, in my opinion. And while I liked the variety of monsters and characters in the He-Man line, I never liked how stiff they seemed with only five points of articulation, like the old Star Wars toys. After G.I. Joe, He-Man seemed to step backwards, so I left He-Man on the shelves back then. Today... He-Man has undergone a makeover, becoming much more detailed and articulated in the process, definitely appealing to my tastes. <laughs> Unlike G.I. Joe, <laughs> rather than try to sell the muscle-bound <laughs> hero on retail shelves again, Mattel, the company famous for Barbie, decided to try an online-only approach. Masters of the Universe Classics is like a cheese of the month club. You buy a subscription to guarantee your figures, a new one every month, plus specialty variants, and they get sent right to your door. But you have to buy the subscription during Comic-Con week, otherwise you're forced to fight for the limited edition online with the rest of the cherry pickers on the day of sale at 9 a.m. Pacific time, usually on the 15th of each month. If you subscribe, of course, you don't need to worry about not getting everything but they won't tell you every figure you'll get before you sign up. It's a surprise, like some of the free send-away figures were in the 80s. The new figures cost $25 each, plus shipping and handling, not including the variant figures you also commit to, which locks you in for only about 600 bucks for a whole year. By the power of Skull, <laughs> who oh wouldn't sign up for that? reading it back, I can hardly believe it, and I'm living it. <laughs> the line started in 2009, but I ordered my first subscription in 2011, the year after my son was born. Perhaps it was a... Thank you. Perhaps it was a last-ditch effort to hold on to something of my own youth. I have a second child now, a daughter, and things are changing for us. Money is tighter meaning I'm having to relinquish some of my precious allowance. Time is shorter. The reality of it all hit me hard last month when my dad passed away suddenly from a massive stroke. At 38, I'm beginning to feel like I should put away childish things, but I'm afraid if I do, I'll lose a part of myself that I've always liked, the part that can just look at a toy and dream up years of fantastic history and backstory and heroic drama. The realities of life and death seem so much more manageable as long as that part of me can stay alive. I try to justify my purchases by doing something other than putting them on a shelf, though I do have a shelf. <laughs> I open them, I pose them, and why would I? I take pictures of them, and I make my own comics with them. For Comic-Con 2012, I spent 200 bucks to make a tiny print run to hand out. I gave one to Larry Hama and a few to the guys at Hasbro, 
and they all received them very graciously. But it was the original artist of G.I. Joe, Herb Trimpey, that really made my year. When he saw my comic, he pulled out his iPhone and showed me pictures he'd taken of his toys. <laughs> World War II pilots from a flight simulation game he loved to play. He was stoked and gave me a poster he was selling, signing it, To Nas, You Are Right. I guess we agreed on a few things. Of course, the kids don't get to play with daddy's toys yet. (laughs) But I don't really think they're interested in him. Turns out, I'm still their favorite action figure. For now. 